going to be like it was in the 70s and early 80s, which would be sort of a stagflation. I don't think the Fed will know how to operate in that, in that environment, but we'll find out. Right now, they look great. We're going to soft land it and everything will be fine. But real rates, if you subtract uh, the inflation rate, you know, from the interest rates are still high. They're still too high. The dollar is falling in, in a, and I think it would continue to fall. So if you're in this stagflation mode and the dollar is falling, that means that everything we're buying is going to be higher. Countries are not as worried about it, Kai, because they keep on buying gold as the hedge. They're not as worried about the dollar now as they would have been. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the EdgeAir Mining Guy on Twitter, or X, you, you, you can choose. And uh, we'll be joined here by Ted Oakley in a few short seconds. He is with Oxbow Advisors. He's a returning guest, and I'm really looking forward to this discussion. It's the first one we've had, or we're doing in a, in a couple weeks, and uh, it's going to be a big one. We've had the Fed meeting yesterday, or the FOMC meeting and uh, press conference yesterday, and uh, 50 basis point cut. But we will discuss with Ted how aggressive that cut was. And of course, what are the ramifications? What can we expect? Are we back into an, into an era of easy money? And uh, the market obviously seems to think so. And uh, we'll, we'll discuss how this will continue. We're also going to talk commodities and gold. Is gold still a buy? We will discuss that as well because we're trading around $2,600. And uh, while the price seems expensive, is it though? We will discuss uh, before I switch over to my guest. Hit that like and subscribe button. It helps us out tremendously, bringing guests like Ted on the program. Now, without much further ado, Ted, it is great to welcome you on the program. Thank you so much for joining us again. Thank you, Kai. Yeah, it's great to see you again. And uh, as I said to you, like we haven't done an interview in two weeks, and uh, it, it's quite refreshing because it got uh, quite repetitive over the last two weeks and uh, ahead of the Fed meeting because there wasn't much going on. But uh, now we got something to talk about, Ted. And uh, the question is... How, how impactful was uh, the, the Fed meeting and the press conference yesterday to the markets? Well, I think people that are chasing, Kai, they go out and think, you know, it's all going to be great now because we're going to go back like we used to be. But when you're coming off 5.5%, uh, you know, Fed funds rate, you have a long way to go before you get to something that uh, should drive the markets like that. Now, you're going to have them chase today, and that's not abnormal. I've seen that before. And then you may get into the next two or three days and have the whole thing reverse. Uh, hard to say at this point. I think uh, I, I found it a little interesting that they would do it before the election. But, hey, I, I don't really try to get get into it all that much. But I will say that people that are making their investment decisions based on the Fed are probably not going to do that well. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is a tricky one, right? Because I think the market expected 25 basis points. The Fed cut 50. It seemed like Jerome Powell, if he could walk his own decision in July back, he would have cut back then already. Also, maybe to take that political stigma off the table. Um, is that is like, were, were they behind? Like, I'm, I, I really want to discuss the impact of actually what happened yesterday to the market because S&P 500 is rallying, for example, uh, and you brought up the bond market in uh, in an off topic, dis or sorry, off off camera here. Um, so I'm curious, like, what, what is the direct impact? Well, where I think people are probably wrong on this, Kai, is that you could easily see, and I think you will see, pricing, asset pricing, and inflation uh, continue higher, say, December, January, you know, first quarter next year. And then what does the Fed do? When inflation, you know, ticks back up, um, and now they're in this idea that hey, we're going to lower, lower, lower. And I think the lowering has to do with they've, they've got to finance these uh, U.S. deficits uh, and also the bonds that are, you know, 15 trillion in bonds coming due the next three years for the for our federal government. That's at a rate of about 2.3 percent, and if they had to put it out today, it'd be five. So. You know, it'd be a tremendous cost. So there's a lot of things working in here, and it's hard to see how they come out. But I do think it ends up being, and I've said this before, we, we said this the last two years, that we felt like the next 10 years it's going to be like it was in the 70s and early 80s, which will be sort of a stagflation. I don't think the Fed will know how to operate in that, in that environment. But we'll find out. Right now they look great. We're going to soft land it and everything will be fine. But real rates, if you subtract uh, the inflation rate, you know, from the interest rates are still uh, high. They're still too high. So 
what should happen is and you'll just have to see this. You'll have to see if they follow that. But if they follow it down, then you have to remember you can inflation can rear its head again. And, and I think that's what will throw them the next six or nine months. Inflation ticking up. I think that's an interesting yeah. topic. I want to explore that a bit more. And uh, six to nine months is a fairly narrow time window because we, for example, we've been pro forecasting a recession for the last three years, it feels like, and it officially hasn't arrived yet. Uh -huh. Officially. That's I think that's the key word here. Right. Um, why, why do you well, think? I, it, I, would, it, I would say this to you, though, on the inflation side, it, uh, I mean, on the recession side, you have, you've had recession. If you look at construction and residential real estate and industrial work there's there's seven or eight areas where we're in basically a recession i mean if you want to look at the numbers that are coming in and i think people think that because the stock market is where it is that there's no recession in these categories if you go out and talk to the businesses in those categories they will tell you that business is slower it's definitely slower and uh, they've had to lay people off. And uh, e even in, in the tech area, if you look at it, you know, to go out and find a tech job today is not easy to do. And I've talked to a number of people in that in the industry. I'm talking about people that place people. And uh, they have so many people trying to get the same job now in the tech area. So we'll see how it pans out. But I think people look at the stock market and forget about what else is going on. And, and usually, it, you know, like employment's the last person that that's the last thing that happens. Everything else happens and then employment, unemployment goes up and uh, we'll, we'll have to see if that's going to take place. Yeah. Unemployment is another big topic we can talk about here in a second, Ted, because uh, the Fed forecast 4.4% will be the end of it in terms of unemployment rate. But we'll debate that in a second. I want, I want to stay on inflation real quick because I'm, I'm, I want to investigate with you. Like what, what, what could be driving prices higher? Like how would that circulate back into the economy? Um, where would it be visible? Well, for, first of all, the dollar is falling, in, in it, and I think it would continue to fall. So if you're in this stagflation mode and the dollar is falling, that means that everything we're buying is going to be higher, okay? So you look at everything, and we bring a lot of, we import a lot of things, uh, and a lot of things would go up. And I'm not talking about just at the consumer level, but I'm talking about at the manufacturing level, and you look at a lot of things that we bring in, uh, are going to go up in price because the dollar goes down. And those countries are not as worried about it, Kai, because they keep on buying gold as the hedge. They're not as worried about the dollar now as they would have been. You know, they used to be tied to it a lot. They're trying to get away from it. So you, it, it's an interesting situation right now. The dollar going down, gold going up, and they're buying more gold. And so the in, in prices they're pushing into us, see, are going to be higher for us. And so I, I think that's where it starts now. The other side of that is you let, if you look at the, the commodity price relative to say the S&P 500, the S&P commodity index, it's all time low. You could have, you don't have to have a lot right now. I mean, you can have things start to move up and it'll be like the seventies. I know nobody, I was around then, but a lot of people don't realize that in the seventies, it threw everybody off because you couldn't buy long bonds, commodities went up, the markets just stayed in a trading range, and, um, and, and, and that's sort of what it came out of that. Then you had gold go up, a lot of things happened, but um, I think that's what people are missing here. If the dollar keeps on sliding, your prices are going up, and then, I don't know this would happen, but it could happen. If you keep having this, all of this thing going on, war-wise in the Mideast, and oil could, if oil goes that much higher, let's say above 3% of GDP, 3.5%, then you're in trouble. And I, I think that's what people forget to see in all of this. And they think, well, the Fed will take care of it. Well, there's a lot of things they can't take care of. And, um, and that's, what I, I, that's why I think the inflation piece will come back in eventually. Maybe it doesn't this month or next month, but I think eventually, it gets back. That's why we have, you know, we have a lot of things in that category. Now, that's an interesting comment because uh, I think people are underestimating that it's a different type of inflation that we'll see this time around. It's not yeah. maybe goods driven like we've seen, like if, because of shortage of supply. 
um, like we've seen during the COVID crunch, like the transitory uh, in- inflation that sort of ebbed away. But the, the dollar decline is an interesting topic because I was looking at the, the yen carry trade, for example, and the weakness of the US dollar against the yen in recent weeks here as well, how, how that could trigger um, a, a decay in, in, in wealth as well, right? Is that something you look at? Well, that's, that's what we look at. For example, we look a lot at what the, the things that come in. You know, we, we bring in different things from other countries. We're bringing a lot of metals, materials. You know, we look at, if you look, we, hit, we have a lot of uh, things that come in there. And um, when they come in now, they're more expensive. Well, if they're more expensive and some of those areas like construction, industrial, already slowing down, that's <laughs> the worst of both worlds. That's true stagflation because all of a sudden, the business is slowing down, but I mean, I'm not paying a lot less prices. I'm actually maybe paying more for some of this stuff. And so you're going to, I think you'll see a lot of that going on. And I just don't think the average investor has the ability to get their arms around that. I mean, I'm trying to put everything in a bit into context, under, trying to understand how the market is moving or why the market is moving and behaving the way it is today. Because are we returning back to easy money? Is the market expecting pretty much 0% interest, um, credit again? Well, they probably are. I mean, I think what they're looking at is that, oh, the Fed's starting to lower rates, so things mm-hmm. are going to be great now. They never, you know, if they looked at any of the history that goes on, and you, you can you can find people that can really support either argument. Market will do a lot better, do a lot worse. But generally, you know, I think they chase these markets as they always do at the wrong time. And uh, to me, that's what we're seeing now. It's, it's, it's interesting the the thing you know we have this things that are going up now are not you know if you took at the the big mag seven stocks only one or two of those are, are at new highs or even at the old high the rest of them are not uh, they're lower than they were in july so you know you've got other stocks that are starting to perk up but that ha- that usually happens at the end of a cycle honestly not the beginning uh but maybe maybe this will be a first for all of that but I, it would surprise me yeah, I'm just just looking at the chart of the S and P 500 at, from the beginning of the year. It's pretty much a straight line. It's uh, I've, it it's, it's, is, yeah, I've, I've it never is, seen anything like that. It is, but if you go back to July 10th and you draw it across to today, you'll see it's up. You know, over one percent today. But if you didn't have today, it's actually down a little bit from July 10th. And yeah. after today, it's going to be up maybe three quarters of a point. A point, okay. Um, that's two months ago. Actually, it's two, a little about two and a half months ago. So it's not like uh, it's not like we're putting on some big boom here. We, a lot of these prices were higher the first week in July than they are now. Uh, but it feels that way to people because you know, you look at the Dow and look at the S and P. But that's where we are now. Nobody's worried about anything. That's how it comes out. I, I know you mentioned the Max Seven here, the Magnificent Seven, but I know you also follow other stocks, and uh, I'm quite curious. Have you come through the earnings reports, Q2 earnings reports? Have you have you found anything that indicates more of a recession or where things are headed potentially? And I'm hinting here, for example, like the Home Depots, the Lowe's, yeah. Target, or so. Uh, is there anything in there that we should be worried about or positive about? To be honest, well, you have to be careful in there with those. I'll tell you why. When they come on CNBC or somewhere and they say. Hey, they beat estimates. Well, they'd already lowered the estimates and, or they'll say something's up when it was already down a lot the last three quarters. So you have to be careful. Let me give you an example. We took a position dollar general a, a few weeks ago when it, when it announced that, Hey, business is not so great. And it hit really a, a super low that, I mean, this stock was down a lot in a, in a two or three month period dollar tree followed. You've had, you know, obviously you had some weakness in, in Home Depot and some weakness, um, you know, in Lowe's. But, you, but you're but you seeing the low end now uh, of those companies that I, two companies I just mentioned there, that, you know, they, they got hit hard because they missed things. And what you're seeing now is a lot of companies are coming out that people don't expect to miss and they're missing the numbers and then they break down. And then the companies that do okay or surprise a little bit on the upside you know that is explode those like you know we've got to buy but it's too late at that point yeah dollar general i think is closing stores as well i've been hearing so the even the low end of the sector is struggling yeah i mean that's that's really that's one reason walmart announced 
decent learnings because people on upper level came down to Walmart. Maybe they didn't go all the way down to Dollar General, but they came from upper levels down to Walmart. And, you know, that's that's really what's happening. You see, you see luxury brands, you know, they're, they've slowed down. No, 100%. And I've uh, been to a few outlet malls when I was in the U.S. 10 days ago, and uh, it didn't look as great as, it, as I remember it. Like, it, it looked abysmal. Like I, I wasn't excited about the shopping experience at all. So I've seen, I've seen it. Uh, I've seen better days. I have to admit, uh, in the in the retail world, and uh, maybe maybe a great segue from from earnings is unemployment, and uh, we we need to talk unemployment number rising. Um, the U the, the Fed expects four point four percent to be the end of it. I feel like we're just gaining momentum on it. I'm curious what your thoughts are on the unemployment market right now, Ted. Well, I certainly wouldn't use their number. I'll say <laughs> that. Okay, they've got you know all those 300 or so academics up there that really are never down on main street. So I wouldn't use their number and nobody really knows. One of the things about inflation is that it's the most lagging indicator. I mean, sorry, unemployment is the most lagging indicator. And since it lags, in other words, if I'm an employer, I'm going to wait as long as I can to let people go because if they're good people, they're hard to hire back or find again. One of the things to notice on that, and you can see this coming, is if you look at, at work hours for the week, you know, they're getting cut. Now, what that means is that, hey, um, I'm not going to lay them off, but I'm going to go from 40 hours to 30 or 40 to 35. And I got I need to save some money doing that. And then the final group of unemployment numbers is when people get to the point and say business is just not that good. And I have to lay some people off and then it spikes. OK. So I, I'm not certain what the Fed thinks they can do to keep that intact, because that's only, what, two-tenths of a point above where we are now. So they must think, man, we've really got a great handle on this. Well, go back about 25 or 30 years and see what kind of handle the Fed has on anything. <laughs> yeah, and to, for that to matter, like what you're saying maybe as well, like if even yeah. a 50 basis point cut won't, won't stop the momentum. I don't think it's drastic enough, in my opinion, to make to make a difference, yet alone the time and lag effect of that trickling down at some point, right? Yeah, I, I hate to be so, I mean, really, I mean, I hate to be so hard on them, but the, the point is we have these people that are unelected, typically a lot of academics, very few business people that know anything about Main Street, and they're actually pulling the puppet strings of what goes on. And I, I think they've done so much damage to uh, really the country and the economy over the last 20 years, and they continue to do it. And now between that and fiscal, you've got a problem here because fiscal, which is, you know, you've heard this term before, fiscal re repression, is where basically, you know, they've got so much debt at the, the government level that it makes the Fed have to do something. See, that's where you get into a jam. And so they can't be independent. And I, I think generally that's where we are. No, no 100% I agree with your views there. And uh, it's always difficult to work with official numbers, but that's what we have, right? right? That's what we have to work with here. We all know it feels different than it is reported. And I think that's that's a fact. And I think everybody, every expert I've had on this program agrees with that, that the official numbers yeah. are off like it doesn't doesn't make any sense um Ted, we got to talk bond market um which i think is the biggest like i think uh, simon hunt called it the root of all evil uh the bond market and uh that's why wars are being fought is the bond market but uh i'm curious now F fed uh comments yesterday the bond market sold off um and we we're seeing an uh, an inversion of the yield curve and uh, i think we need to explore that uh, that part of the market um what what is the direct a what is the direct impact of the fed cutting rates yesterday and to, what does the inversion of the real, uh, the the yield curve mean well the direct impact of the fed for example I'm, every day i look at the 3 month and 6 month treasury yield cuz we own a lot of floating rate U.S. Treasury, so we want to see what that rate would be. And it's about like I thought, when Fed funds come from five and a half to five, which they are, then you're going to have the three months trading around four and three quarters, which is still not a bad yield, by the way. Um, and I think that's been the impact. You're, you're dropping the lower rates. If you look at three months to 18 months, you know they're going down. But if you look at the long end, They've gone up. And I, I, I think generally on the long end, what they're what the marketplace is telling the Fed is 
we really don't believe you on inflation. So we're, we're not going to rally that long bond too much, maybe some. And uh, maybe, maybe that changes. You go into a deeper recession and then the bond rallies. But for us, we don't have a lot of exposure to long, the long duration. We have some, I will tell you, but we, we picked that up about two and a half, three months ago. And it's done okay, but we watch it in here because uh, you may not have a lot further to go with the long end. Maybe not. It will see. But on the short end, uh, you know, you what we did, what we've done in the last four or five, six months is we moved a lot of our three-month paper to 12, 15, 18-month, and two-year paper. And the idea for us there was that no matter what the Fed does, if they lower the rates, that's good for that because we have a lock-in. If they don't lower the rates or we go the other way, then I just have to wait for those bonds to come due and I still don't get hurt. I don't know if that makes sense, but it does. In other words, you're trying to handle it so that from a risk management standpoint, we don't get hurt either way. That's, yep. that's where we are. I was going to ask you to clarify that. Like, what? why are you moving three to six months to, to six, 12, maybe 18 month well, paper? I'm just trying to understand yeah. that because you're giving up about a percent in yield, uh, uh, maybe half a percent. Well, to you a percent. would be today, but not when we did it. Okay. When we did it. We did it while rates were at two year was at five. Okay. See, and the one year was at five. The eighteen month, everything was at five, and and the floating rate was like a five thirty five. <laughs> so we gave up a little bit to lock in. We we the last thing we locked in was about a four ninety, mm -hmm. but see that was before. Yeah. So now the rates go down. This is what we expected would happen. They go down, but we're protected with a lot of that money now at, at five for six months, a year, 18 months, that kind of thing. And and see, our two year now is coming up pretty soon to only be an 18 month piece of paper because when we picked it up, because we, you know, we're further into it. But um, we wouldn't do that now. I don't mean to imply that we would do that now, but that's what we did then. Um, and I still think that'll pay off because if they keep on lowering rates, We've got to lock up on that. We've locked in at, you know, close to five on everything for the next 18 or 20 months right now. Yeah, I was going to, you sort of answered my question, like, because the follow-up question would be, how happy are you with a 4.7% uh, yield on the three months or even 45 on the six months right now? Like, is that even, like, is that something you're even interested in? Oh, yeah. We have still quite a bit in the floating rate treasury, which prices off of the 90-day every Monday. So it prices off of the three month high, but what happens is uh, on that is that if you look at the inflation rate, just take the inflation rate, you're still what almost 1.6, 1.7% above the inflation rate. And that that's usually not that way. So it's not like you're giving up anything by the rates coming off, you instead of paying five and a quarter now, 475. You're still well ahead of inflation, and that's the name of this game. I mean, you got to stay ahead of inflation. Can, can I be a bit cheeky, Ted? Because because you're using now the official inflation number to to sort of yeah. what do you call it, like um, explain your reasoning why that's an attractive yield. Yeah. Like, can, can can you explain that? I mean, like, why do you feel comfortable using the official inflation number to explain that versus maybe the unemployment number that you don't believe yeah. in? I'm just curious, like a bit of a child, bit of a cheeky question there, Ted. Sorry. Well, I don't necessarily believe in the particular. In, you know, CPI either. Cause I think, I think there are a lot of things that they don't factor in. If you look at, for example, you know, rent is a big piece of that number, you know? And so that, that, that may not go down a lot, you know, it could, could maybe it's going to be that way, but that's a real big piece of the CPI. But um, I, I just look at what, generally what I think is that I understand what's going on with soft goods and groceries and different things, but a lot of those things too have turned and come off. Now, if you, you go in and look at a lot of soft commodities, they look at all the grains. They're a lot lower. I mean, a lot lower than they were a year ago. They bumped up a little bit, but so from that standpoint, yes, for us to get a clean look at the CPI, uh, I don't know how we would do it. I, I, all I know is that what I generally see, and I think the assets are going to price this way, they're going to price against the CPI versus what the, the yield is. And as long as it does, now if it goes out, the, you know, for example, it changes and all of a sudden 
that that correlation is not working at all, then we'll go different direction. But, you know, we have a lot of gold, we have a lot of things, we have oil, different things that would hedge that too. But, you know, you, you just take with what they give you. Yeah, I was watching uh, Jerome's, Jerome Powell's press conference with one uh, one ear yesterday. And uh, one, one thing I, I perked up and uh, I just looked up the quote is... Uh, yeah, but if, uh, the total PCE prices rose 2.2% over the 12 months ending in August, and that excluding the volatile food and energy categories, core PCE prices rose 2.7%. And, and, and my favorite part is the excluding of volatile food and energy prices. Yeah. Like, how is that even a possibility that you can exclude that, which is the most basic thing for everybody? I have no <laughs> idea why back there a number of years ago they even did that, Kai, because it makes no sense, okay? Yeah. What? The, you're going to always have to buy fuel and you're going to have to have a place to rent. You're going to have to buy food, those three things. And right. yet um, for them to take it, I, it's, it's ludicrous. Really. You should never take that out. Yeah. No, th thanks for humoring me. It's like we went a bit down of a rabbit hole here with, uh, on, on the, on the numbers here, but um, b back to the bond market real quick, because we talked about inversion of the yield curve. And uh, I mentioned to you before hitting the record button, it feels like for the last two years, we've been talking about, oh, the yield curve is inverted. We must be in a recession or that's a recession trigger. And uh, depending on who you have on, the guests have like, oh, it must be 270 days after that hits. That's when usually we hit a recession plus or minus 90 days. And now we've had the uninversion of the yield curve and everyone says, okay, we must be in a recession now, right? What What is the right way and what's the right answer here, Ted? Well, I don't think anybody knows on recession. <laughs> you could still have times when you know the economy doesn't do all that well um and i i think that people don't realize again that certain parts of the economy are in recession it hasn't shown up in the stock market but if you look at i think what will happen is stagflation bit we're talking about the dollar and all that i think the margins will fall there's a lot of things that could come into play and i i'm sure people are going to say you know we're not going in recession they've got this thing handled I don't think you know yet. I don't think you'll know that until you get into maybe nine months, a year out, because you, think about it. You have an election coming. You have a change in government, no matter who wins. There's a lot of changes come from that. And uh, my, my guess is that a lot of businesses are saying, you know, I think I'll just hold on that for a while. But I, I think it's too early to know that. Uh, maybe we get out 18, 24 months and they say, hey, hooray. They were able to get through and, and not any show any numbers, but uh, and we may not have one. I don't know. I, I just know this: you're having one in a lot of areas, and so that's 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 the difference between now and some other time. Yeah, it's interesting. Like I mentioned to you before hitting the record button as well, researching for this uh, conversation. And like, um, let me bring that up on the screen here a little quick. Um, 10-year treasury yield jumps as investors bet there's no recession ahead. And then I don't have a screenshot of it, but. Uh, I think it was, oh, duh, I can't find it. No, oh, there it is. Sorry. S&P 500 hits all-time high on soft landing hopes, right? So it's like even depending on uh, the news outlet, they can't make up their mind if we were having a soft landing, if there's a recession, or everything's honky-dory, right? Um, it's it's muddy out there. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I think people, one of the things I find right now is that people are, that they're totally complacent. They're, they're really not, the market's up, you know, the real estate's doing well, I mean, you know, from where it was four years ago or five years ago. So it's like, you know, hey, I'm rich. <laughs> so I think that's kind of the attitude that's out there right now. So until you have some breakage of that, probably going to feel the same way. Ted, one topic before we get to gold and commodities is the housing market. And uh, I, I like throwing in personal anecdotes, anecdotes from time to time. And I spend way too much time on Instagram these days. Uh -huh. But uh, I get fed real estate reels and talking about the real estate market. And uh, quite often I get fed like housing market prices collapsing, developers selling uh, at huge discounts. Um, I'm curious, like if you're witnessing the same because you are based in the US, I'm just being fed propaganda through Instagram here. But I'm curious, like, are you witnessing that as well? Like, how stable is the housing market? Is there anything we should be concerned about? Well, supply is going up. Uh, you know, it's just in the San Antonio, Texas uh, paper here 10 days ago that they have the they have a, I believe, 11 month supply, the highest it's been in many years. And you're starting to see that in a lot of cities. And then you're starting to see these hot cities that were so hot, Nashville, Florida, Austin, um, you know, uh, Phoenix, all those sorts of places, Kansas City, they're, they're slowing down. And particularly at the high end, I mean, you're seeing 
markdowns and all of those properties. Now the builders are still selling those 250 to $300,000 houses. They're really not much of a house. They're like a uh, sort of a glorified uh, hut because they're small. I mean, they're talking about no, you know, no, no footage at all. So they sell that to make people feel good that they're in a house. But I'm talking about a house that's, you know, 2,500 feet or higher. You know, that, that market's not working right now. Uh, and realtors, so they'll tell you it's picked up a little bit. Uh, most of the new, new, um, most of the builders I know, even private builders, they're buying down the rates. So they're able to get these people in at five and three quarters or something like mm -hmm. that. But it's not a hot market right now. It's just not. Actually, it's like, probably that what triggered the question actually, Ted, is I read earlier today, about three hours ago, we got uh, existing home sale numbers and they're uh -huh. down 2.5% uh -huh. uh, from the previous month. So that was in the back of my head probably when I saw that. And uh, it's not looking too great. Uh -huh. Maybe well, August is not the moving month, but uh, uh, the it's not looking rosy. I would tell you the media really messes it up because it's been a zigzag down. In other words, when I say zigzag, every few months, you know, say every three months, you'll have a little tick up. And then that, that big headline will be housing picks up big month, you know, well, it's not, you know, you got to go back and look, <laughs> you have to go back and look at the trend here, the rate of change. It's not working right now. No, no, it's, uh, the numbers confirm it. We're down to yeah. 5% again. So, and as you said, Florida, I've been being fed a lot of actually uh, real estate development reels out of Florida where mm -hmm. complete neighborhoods are empty and uh, they're slashing prices left, right and center. So, well, that's true quite interesting um ted um to sort of like put a bow i wouldn't say a bow around it but uh, i like con uh, what do you call it like tying the conversation together you talked about your dollar decline mm -hmm. and uh, you also mentioned your own gold so i'm trying to figure out okay gold at twenty six hundred dollars and and uh, the dollar declining is, is gold a buy right now given that backdrop well i, I you know i think if you buy gold uh, you have to think of gold like this at any time you buy it it could correct, you know, 10 or 15%. But if you're buying it for the long haul, and I say, you know, the next three or four years, you, you could buy it now. Yeah. You know, maybe you don't buy as much as you normally would, but you could certainly buy it. I think the, I think the investing public and even the pros are very, very uninvested in gold and gold miners. I know they've moved, but I think they're very underinvested so that when they finally catch on, a la like a 2011, these prices and gold price too could be, you know, much, much higher than people are thinking right now. And maybe it's not, but if you look at gold over time, you have to think about it this way. If I own it, I'm going to own it for a long time because you will go through periods where you'll have three or four years where nothing happens. Maybe it goes down, but on the long run, you go back and look at the number one performing asset since January 1 of 2000 <laughs> over the S&P and anything else, gold. <laughs> now, people say, yeah, but I didn't make any money between 11 and 16. No, I understand. But you also didn't make any money in the S&P between 2000 and 2012. So which, which one do you want? You know, And I'm not saying you put the whole portfolio on gold, but if you see the next 10 years, under what we think will be, you know, I've, I've come, we've been saying this all along, it'll be different. And a lot of pros in my business don't know how to handle this and they won't know how to trade. You're going to have to trade bonds. You're going to have to own commodities, some commodities have to own some gold. And, and I think if you've got to have that in your portfolio, if you're going to have a good mix and you, you can't just depend on these seven or eight stocks, because if we're in for that kind of period, gold will be, it will be fine. If you bought it here and it comes off a couple hundred bucks, I understand that. Don't sell it though. I mean, you know, because you you can look up, you know, the next five years and maybe it's four thousand. Uh, but so I I I I don't buy into that idea that hey, you know, because now we're in a period that we've never been in a period uh, in a long, long time, Kai, where all these foreign governments that are buying gold they do not want the dollar, and they keep on buying gold. They then they see this trade, for example oil, gold, dollar. Okay. And I think what they're trying to do is say, we want to get to a point where we can hedge all of that. And gold is what we're going to do it with. And that's going to be our new, maybe world reserve. I'm talking about country by country now, but you just see, they keep on buying it. And if in the, in the U in the public, our public, 
and investment managers. They're, they're totally underweight gold and gold miners. They, they own very little of it. We've all been following the news in recent days and, and sort of to follow up on that, like gold seems to be also quite a be a, ge a geopolitical tool um, as well. And the question is now, Ted, like how geopolitical is the gold price right now as well? I know you, you mentioned central banks buying, of course, which could also be a geopolitical tool, like almost like a weapon. But uh, like looking at what Israel has been doing with Hezbollah, like is there a chance of escalating um, the situation in the Middle East? And is that priced in into the gold price right now? Oh, I, I, I don't think so. I think it's just a steady rise based on what's going on with trade and the countries. Again, if these countries could snap their fingers tomorrow, these, in these top 11 or 12 countries that really have been buying all the gold, they would love to have a currency that they could use that was backed by gold that they could trade everything with. And they, they, they understand what's going on with the dollar and they understand what the U.S. government is doing. You know they're 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 going to run themselves ragged by this debt, and it, it's and it's it, there's no good into it, and so I think that's why they look at the thing the way they do right now. No, hundred percent, hundred percent, and uh, we're we're seeing it more. There was a recent article that Saudi Arabia bought like 160 tons of gold um, yeah. off market in, from from Switzerland. Massive, massive momentum behind the gold price, in my opinion, yeah. and. Uh, We'll, we'll see it continue. Um, Ted, very last question. I asked you the same question last time as well. If I were to come to you with $100,000 to invest, how would you allocate my money right now? Or just make me a John Doe, just uh, anybody. I know well, not investment advice, well, and uh, it's just to, to, to sort of put a bow around yeah, the conversation. Mean, you know, I, well, the 100000 I'm not certain on. But I, I uh, <laughs> make it a million. I, I don't mean that. I'm not, uh, I don't mean that to disparaging remark for people with 100 grand. It's just that our managed accounts are bigger. And so what happened, but I'll just give you percentages. I think yeah, that's perfect. more important. I think what you have to do right now is decide, first of all, for you as a person, this is the number one thing for you as a person to decide how does volatility affect me? And once, if somebody tells me that, then from that I'll go, and if it's just an average person that can accept some volatility, let me use that as an example. Well, we would have them set up in something like, like we said before, 30, 30, 30, 10, we'll have like 30% uh, that are in, uh, you know, short-term paper. And we, we, just, we just think you can't be a long-term paper buyer here in this next 10 years. You can trade it, but you can't own it for whatever. So you want to keep those maturities, say, listen. And I say, we're saying you need about 30% in commodities, commodity stocks, gold, everything is in that, oil, that whole package. Um, and, and you're going to have to have, and in that, you know, and then, then you're going to have to have, um, you, you can have some stocks, but it's going to be a lower number. It's probably going to be 30% and then about 10% cash that can trade. So that, that's the way I would, if I were recommending somebody like that, that's, it, it was said to have an average volatility idea. That's where we would go. It, it depends on the person. I mean, <laughs> A lot of people don't like any volatility, so we have to go a different direction. But I mean, the average person, you have to think about that. And then, Kyle, I want to throw this in. Age has a lot to do with it. And I will tell you that a lot of people today over 65, and we see it all the time, even over 85, have way too much stock. I mean, they, they, they're they blinded by, they've, made, they've done really well the last 10, 12 years. And they're blinded by that. Um, and and, and I, I keep asking that question to them. Are you okay if for some reason a year or two from now you only have 60% of that or 70% of that? that? That They can't answer that question because they can't even fathom that could happen. But if you're going to be the kind of investor that lives for every day and makes it through to the other side, no matter what, you're going to have to have a safety valve. Uh Junior mining stocks are definitely not for the faint of heart as well. So don't throw that in that mix, especially well, not for 85 year old investors. That's uh, that's not a good idea. So um, well, I'm Ted. Sure, actually, I'm sure people will make money on those, you know, over the, over this next period. I heard about that. I heard but, about that. But uh, <laughs> I, the average, you're right about this. The average verse investor doesn't know how to go about doing it. So they should buy an index and forget about it. That's what they want.
uh, GDX. Like, I'm not a fan of ETFs personally because I don't think yeah. it helps the underlying no. companies. But because uh, the money doesn't flow directly into the companies, of course, helps the share price appreciation. But uh, money doesn't flow in directly yeah. as a as a form of investment. Well, Ten, we don't I, buy. You know, we don't buy ETF. We we buy single stocks, single yeah. stocks, single bonds, treasury, whatever we're buying is a name is you know and it's a uh, and it's a name we want to own typically for the next five to 15 years so we buy single names because i don't want i don't want some some index messing up my pricing because of something they're doing some weird rebalancing we've yeah. seen it way too many times in in the gdxj which is supposed to be junior miners but i think kinross just got deleted from it so maybe we're a bit uh on the on the market cap side a little lower again but i haven't looked yeah. at it because the change just happened last week i wouldn't have so. had kinross in there but i guess you know i guess they have to have the ones they can trade exactly ted, ted what a wonderful conversation i always enjoy catching up with you where can we follow more of your work where can uh, our audience and listeners uh, reach out to you you know, Kai, the best place and everything's there is at octopoadvisors.com. And you'll see, we really are very transparent. You'll see you know, our newsletters, you'll see interviews we do. Um, you'll, you'll see comments we make about certain asset situations. You'll see our quarterly, we always do quarterly videos on what we own and how we see it. Um, and you'll, you'll see those there. We're, um, we're, we're not one of those people to hide, but uh, but you'll see a lot of what we do on OxboyAdvisors.com. Fantastic. Ted, I really appreciate it. You, I really appreciate your time. Thanks so much for coming back on SOAR Financially. Really appreciate it. And to everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this conversation here with Ted Oakley. Did we rise to ask the right questions? Did you get something useful out of this conversation? That's the whole point. We're trying to educate and make you a better investor. I hope, it, you know, trying to make sense of the market. It is quite volatile out there. It is quite muddy out there, like in terms of like visibility, like, I have a hard time predicting where this market is going right now. Are we going to see 6,000 in the S&P? Are we going to see 3,000 in gold? Or are we crashing down to 4,000 maybe in the S&P? I have a hard time predicting that right now. There are too many factors at play. Geopolitics is another whole big topic. We'll have to get Simon Hunt and uh, Alistair McLeod back here on the channel to make some more sense of that. In the meantime, please like, subscribe, and follow. It helps us out tremendously, and uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much for tuning in, and uh, we'll be back with more. Thank you so much.